All righty, welcome to yet another Sunday afternoon live stream. Another hot day today here. Um, I almost had to cancel or change the date because at the very last minute, my grandson's church decided to have their uh, first communion service, if you were, or mass for all of the new students. And um, yeah, they made it today, and it happened to be at 3 this afternoon, and there was no way that I could attend without switching or canceling altogether, and there was too much that we had already prepared. So I let him know, and he said, I, I understand, Grandpa, so I'm going to see him tomorrow anyway. We're going to spend the whole day together. And you know what he told me? He said, We're gonna, you're going to see me four days in a row. Well, not really. Today I didn't get to see him except for at a distance. What happened was the... Uh, Church also had a limit as to, you know, the number of uh, family members that could attend. So anyway, I decided to bail out and let my wife go in my place. Anyway, so we are here and we have a few people here with us. We are up to 14 folks already. I didn't get a chance to announce this on Facebook as I had planned. But we have Mike Lee again, as you may have seen in the actual announcement. And he's got... Um, something to talk about. He's going to use a board and he's going to write it out just like being back in school. We're going to learn a lot, I hope. So first of all, I want to ask everyone who who is watching at the moment to go ahead and share with us who you are. We have 18 and we got about maybe 10 people here on the chat. Tell us who you are, where you're watching from, your printer of choice, if you have one. And if you do not, your printer or dream printer, do you wish to possibly own in the future, what your interests are. And then after Mike is done, we're going to open it up to a all, you know, a free for all, if you will, questions and answers. And I also am going to go to Keith Cooper's site and take a closer look at the new Pro 300. And he did an extremely detailed report and tutorial and in overall, um, what do they call it, a review on it. And so it's probably one of the best ones out there, if not the best, most complete review on that new groundbreaking printer that we're all salivating about. I'm waiting for that Pro 100 new one, the update, and see what they offer us. All righty. So let me very, very quickly say hi to everybody. Engine, it can see. 
Germany. I probably killed that name. Sorry. I apologize. Harold Goldberg is here as well. Uh, he says it's very humid in Richmond, 100 degrees, not quite that hot here, 91, but extremely humid. I didn't cut the grass like I should have. It would have killed me. Henry Stoffel is here. He's got a P800. He uses QImage. Roger Jones from Portland, Oregon, 100 degrees out there. Supposed to be nice and cool in Portland. Come on. That is crazy. Roger Jones from Oregon, 100 degrees, he said. Yes, you did that twice. Um, Michael Cavalier, Cavalieri uh, from Connecticut is here as well. Hot day, hydrate is the word. Sebastian Kloon, best wishes from Germany. Ted Summers, engine says, hi, Sebastian. He's talking. I love it when you guys are actually talking to each other. Awesome. Don Anderson from Astoria, Oregon. A couple of Oregonians. Wow. King Kong is here. Wow. From London. And he uses an etch -a sketch Are you seriously? Are you, are you ser being serious? Sebastian Kloon. Uh, software firmware update for the Pro 100 printer. Longer panoramas. Is that something you know is a fact? Or is that something you wish would happen? All righty. So... Anyone else who wants to chat, go ahead and put it. I will keep be keeping track. I know I may have missed a person or two last time, but again, it's hard to do that when you're also interacting at the same time. So I'm going to bring in Mike at this moment. We're going to ask him to see what kind of week he had. And hopefully we will have a great live stream. Hello, Mike. Hello, Hello everyone. Hello, you want to lower uh... the volume a little bit, buddy? Just a wee bit. Okay, how's that? Yeah, that's good. It was just sounding very boomy. All righty. What's new? Oh, well, it's two weeks. Um, the last time I was here, we were discussing what we saw off uh, Keith Cooper's detailed review of the Pro 300. We were salivating. It was, was called drilling. an image. I was drilling like a dog. Image prograph. Mm hmm and he indicated was doing some calibration and alignment. Well, as time went on, I asked uh, Keith Cooper directly whether or not it was a calibration he was doing. Because as you know, on the image program on the 1000 and in, higher. In a printhead calibration. Well, it, apparently that's what he meant. But we color people tend to think, Calibration is more color calibration. So we were off to the races in the wrong direction. No, it doesn't have a densitometer. And uh, because it doesn't have that, it's just a little step up from a Pro 10. There may be some more, as we'll find out, media handling options, perhaps. You know, with the relaxation of the of the borderless and, and the fine art settings, etc. Mm -hmm. But um, at this point, for the huge price increase, uh, I'm not a fan. You know, it's 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 a huge increase for very little extra features if you don't need those yeah. features. But if you find a feature in it that's compelling, hey, it's worth it. Yeah. It's worth it if, if you know you find that feature compelling. So that's what happened in the last couple of weeks. And uh, I think I pointed you to something I found. Yeah. We'll go through that later on. We can interpret what that's coming down to. Uh, not all your viewers are refillers, but if you are a refilling person or thinking of it, this could be of significance. Um. Other than that, it's been a, I can't say it's been a quiet week. It's been a busy week for me. Um, but nothing dramatically new. Just every day, every day something new happens. That's why I keep saying uh, it's becoming more and more difficult to come up with new videos. And what I've been forced to do is I'm going to be just looking and doing Q&A videos on the uh, channel from now on until something new lands on my lap 
something dramatically new that I can then, you know, uh, make several videos covering whatever that may be. Uh, right mm -hmm. now, all I can do is basically answer the same questions I get asked almost daily. And uh, that's going to be it. We're going to have to rely on these Sunday afternoon live streams again until something new lands on my lap. Um, I'm reviving my R3000, my R3000, my R2000. If anyone's interested in those older printers, I got them connected to the system. I got a brand new hub that allowed me to add some more USB connections. It's getting ridiculous here. And um, we're going to go ahead and turn the R3000 into a sublimation printer with inks from the guy next to me this way. So we're going to go ahead and do that. And that Well, now that you mentioned the R3000, Joe, my R3000, as you probably know, two weeks ago, I told you it quit on me. Mm -hmm. Now I'm seriously, before that, I had considered maybe I'd, I'll just not revive it and let it go its natural way. I'm thinking of actually getting it fixed. Mm -hmm. And we'll go down the road. Uh, we'll see as you bring up those, those issues why that may be something. And, oh, I, I got some calls in the last couple of weeks. And I'm of the opinion now that if you can't get a P800 and you are you own a 3080, it may be worthwhile if you're a refiller to absolutely go get that thing fixed. Mm -hmm. Pay the hundreds of dollars, get it fixed, and I think you might be a happier camper there. So even the P600, if that conks out on you, you may find that, yeah, it's a lot of money to get it fixed, but the alternatives are not looking bright. Yeah, especially with the P600, that's going to skyrocket. We, You, you know, know what I'm talking about concerning that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so was there really an advantage? And this is probably why I didn't jump on the P600 when it came out. I already had a R3000. What were the differences, if any, between the two printers? Was there any ink um, changes? Uh, yes. Yeah. Improvements that we could yeah, that, that we, we could actually see on print and uh, well, to measure. Uh, to Whatever. me, the most significant differences between the R three thousand and the P six hundred is really one visual quality. Could you really see a big difference? It was not huge. It was a very minor difference. Uh, would the average person see it? Highly doubt it. Um, your viewers may or may not know that the R3000 and P600 actually used the identical color inks, right down to the coloration, not just the name, but the coloration were identical. What Epson did do is it did improve the yellow which was weaker than the other colors. They also appear to have had an issue with their light blacks in settlement. Mm. And that appeared to be cured. So um, the other significant issues that between the R3000 and the P600 is that the P600 tended to use more of the darker colors when printing mm -hmm. than the R3000. So your ink consumption would be a little more balanced. It wouldn't be totally out of whack like you get in the R3000 where the lighter colors are used a lot more than the darker colors. You're referring it's, to the magentas and cyan. Yeah, the light magenta versus magenta, cyan, light cyan. Mm -hmm. All right, so it tended to use a more even balance and that same behavior was exhibited by the P800 and the 3880. The newer printer tend to even out a little more of the ink consumption when you use the same image. So it's it's what inks it was using to produce that, that identical image was slightly different. Mm -hmm. But the biggest difference between the P600 and R3000 is what people call clogging. The P600, I found, could run 
a lot longer between printing before you develop bad nozzle checks. The R3000, and I tested this for about three, four years. The first year, I tried printing every within every couple of weeks, sometimes three, and the 3000 just would not cut it. It would have lots of problems. And this is exactly what a lot of people report, that if they stop printing, they got to do some head cleans. The P600, on the other hand, in that same cycle, always seem to have little or no problems. And that's with the so same the identical usage. You saw it better. Yeah. So, so from a from a user standpoint, if you if you got a P six hundred, an R three thousand, you absolutely. You, if you're going to go out shopping for a used printer, you can neglect the PC. More? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, you could neglect it more. Yeah, Great. so that you can not have to do what Joe's telling you to do. Right. <laughs> Which I don't necessarily follow my own advice, as right. everybody knows. So you know, yeah. So if, if you're going shopping for a new printer, absolutely, you would want to pick a P600 over R3000 from that standpoint. The other thing too is that the P600, you could get an uh, an external resetter for it. Yeah. So you never get a lockout issue if you're holding on to resetter. Ah. Many people have no clue what you're talking about, Mike. Oh boy. They'll see that's another I, I I'm I guarantee you many people have no clue what you are referring to by Okay, let lockout. let me let me explain what a lockout situation is. And I'm gonna do this in a parallel universe of your own life. So suppose you want to go on a trip that's three say two hundred miles away. Right? Let me lean so, back and relax. All right. right. So on this trip, you've, you've done your Google Maps and you figured everything out and you go, hey, there's no gas stations between here and there. So before you leave, what you got to do is you got to figure out whether you got enough gas to make that trip, right? Right. If you don't have enough gas, you're not going to go because you don't want to get stuck in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Well, oddly enough, the same thing happens with uh, a P600 or R3000, a P800, etc. So Be even an R2880, this is where I first learned about this. Before you go any further, I think you're talking about Epson printers with a black ink, ink switch yes. feature. Yes, that's correct, Joe. Yes, yeah. I, I neglected that. Thanks for pointing that yeah. out. Yeah. Whether yeah. it's automatic or whether it is a manually change. Yeah, the black switch. Like the 2880, the 2400, the 2200 had a manual right. black ink switch. System. Right, right. Go ahead. So so what happens is, is that, you know, there's this little chip on the printer, these ink tanks that tells the, the, the printer how much ink it's actually got left or it thinks it has left. Mm -hmm. let's, let's, make sure, let's make sure we understand that. Okay, it tells the printer how much ink it thinks it has left in the ink tanks. So when you do a switch, essentially the printer knows it's going to have to consume some ink. It's going to have to make a trip to do that switch. In why this trip... That? Why is that, Mike? Why is what? Why does it have to use up ink? Hey, it's Epson. you got to pay them. Yeah. No, no, no. It, 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 you basically got eight channels. One of the channels is that black ink. And if it's a photo black. Folks, it's only one channel that's black. And then you have two types of black that have to share that same single channel. Right. Here comes the nightmare. Go ahead. So you've got, uh, you've got ink in that print head or ink lines. Remember, this happens even on an R2880. So not only does it have to switch out the black ink that's left in the printhead, it's got to clear the valve as well. So it, it has to use a lot of ink. So it knows that if it's going to, it's like making a 200-mile trip, it looks at its gas tank and says, hey, 
do I have enough ink in my gas tank to make that trip? Now, when you make that trip, not only will it use black, but it also will use some other colors. But it will predominantly use more black because it will start spitting out black ink in a false printing mode kind of thing, just to spit it out and clean the head out. Okay, so, but it, it this predominantly happens when people try to switch to black. Yeah, it has to it has to push out the old black ink, right? The previous one and make room for the new one, especially if you're going from a glossy a glossy black ink, and now you want to print on a matte media. You have to right. push out some matte black ink, and vice versa. Otherwise, you're going to end up with matte-looking shadows if you're printing with matte black ink on glossy paper. That's why the switch needs to take place. So, continuing, it figures out whether or not it's got enough ink to make that switch. If it sees that it needs, say, 2 ml of ink, matte black ink, to switch from photo black to matte black, and it thinks it's only got one ml left, it's not going to proceed. It's locked up. It says, we can't switch because there's not enough ink to make that switch. It won't make the trip. And people are now locked out because they want to print matte black, and they'll never get to matte black when they're refilling. Now, this happens even with OEM inks. If it sees that the, the the color to be switched to is too low or is insufficient, it will not proceed. Let me let me ask you a question that I think needs clarifying because a lot of people think that the lockdown or lockup is just a pre a pre warning, saying, "Hey, don't don't commit to this because you don't have enough supply." to proceed with this ink exchange? Or will it allow you to go into the uh, ink switch and then realize it after the fact and lock you? So you need to go to the local store and buy a new cartridge to be able to continue. Well, if you if you had followed Epson's advice and, told, and, it, and it told you you were getting low and you bought one, you're never going to get it locked out. Mm -hmm. Right, but if you ignored it, and you That's switch away from a low level cartridge, a very low cartridge, you may have trouble getting back to it. Mm -hmm. Right? So, even when you're using an OEM tank, if you may have an OEM tank with ink in it, but not enough to switch to it. Right. So, it tells you go buy a new one. Now, after you buy a new one, you put it in, you switch to it, you can always remove it put the nearly empty one back in and continue yeah. to use it till it's empty. Right. When yeah. that's empty, then you put back in the fuller yeah. one. Because it's only going to lock you out if it thinks there's not enough ink to perform the ink switch. Right. So you take that, what what should we call that cartridge? We got to give it a name. It's just going to be you. From to? Yeah. You're going to put that cartridge in that has enough ink physically and of course, enough ink, as far as the chip is concerned, it will go ahead and perform that action, remove it, and put the one that was nearly empty, not full enough to allow you to perform that change. You see what I mean? And then mm -hmm. just wear that one out until it's empty, and you're good to go. What about if you're using refillable cartridges? Well, that's the biggest problem. Because if you got ARC auto reset chips, if it doesn't go empty on you, you can't reset. But on the P600, you can have an external resetter that you can force whatever ink level that is low back to a full situation so you can always switch to it. And, of course, you can always top it off while you're doing that as well. Always not yeah. can. You always top yeah. off if you're going to reset any chip because you tell yourself, I'll remember to do it next week and... You don't remember, you run out of ink, and you'd be very, very, very sorry 
I don't know whether you ever get that question, Mike, but I do. Do I really have to refill my Canon cartridges when I reset them or vice versa? If I top it off to full, do I really have to reset the chip? I, I, I tell them this. Imagine if your gas gauge didn't fully reflect within a half gallon or so what you actually have in your tank. Would you then go on a 500-mile trip? <laughs> I wouldn't. It, it, it couldn't be trusted. So, yeah, reset your chip, top off your cartridge. Top off your cartridge, reset your chip. Not necessarily in that order. But it hey, is Joe, yeah, you realize know. that in 20 years, people may not understand what you're talking about when we got electric cars. That's true. Then you have to charge your batteries. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anyways, um, so we're talking about a lockout. Yeah, th this the low, the low level doesn't have to be just black. It can also catch you in one of the colors as well. Okay, so so the P600 has an advantage over the R3000. Now, some people are very lucky with the R3000s if they bought their machines early and got some aftermarket cartridges, the early ones, because these had a built-in reset mechanism on the ARC chip, which allowed them to reset them. But these are battery-operated. I think... Joe, you've probably been, been asked about yeah. Yeah. batteries and chips not yeah. working. But basically, you can reach that. Yeah. If, if you remember, Michael, I know you sold them. The ones that had the battery, and you had to short out two little well, ports. Let me get something. I think I can bring one and okay. show people. And then those needed, you can use anything, a paper clip, whatever, to, to short out two little circular brass dots on the chip. And that would reset the the chip to full on the fly, regardless of what level it was at when you performed that. Then I have a set of cartridges on my okay, I'm back right now, except for this one. This is with a modern auto reset chip. That's the one you sent me, Mike. Um, yeah. The ones that I have there have a push button that okay. interrupts power, but only after the cartridge chip has declared it empty you have to right. reach a point where it's empty then you push the button close the lid and it's back to full again you better top okay. it off also here in front of me i have one of these battery operated chips these two connections here those two dots to reset this chip on an r3000 all you've got to do is short this for about one second or half a second. So you just take a paper clip or anything and just join those two connections. Yeah, anything. Connections, and that will reset the chip. Okay, so you don't need to get an external resetter. These chips were discontinued by the manufacturers very early on because people did not know that. Let me show you how you remove it. You just pluck it out. Okay, you just pull it out. There's a little battery in there, a watch battery. I guess it's not this this cheap webcam. Well, it wasn't that cheap. It doesn't focus that well, but yeah, we can see. It. Yeah, that silver thing. That's a battery. Yeah, that's a watch battery. battery. So many people who bought these did not realize there was a battery on these chips, and. Um, when this battery runs low, you would get chip issues of non-recognition. So many vendors didn't even realize that they were selling that needed batteries and batteries always eventually run out. And they would get complaints of defective goods, defective cartridges. So I think the manufacturers got fed up with it and then resorted to no batteries. And you couldn't get these anymore. But these, in the hands of somebody who understood that, and these batteries aren't expensive, they're like five, six for a dollar. 
uh, but in the hands of somebody who knows what you're doing, why they're there, were excellent. But if the consumer didn't know, they ended up being a real nightmare. So that's a switch out and lock out. And those types of batteries, you can imagine how long they may have sat in a warehouse. By the time you get yeah. it to a third party seller like Mike, and by the time he sends them to you, you know, how long yeah. that battery has been sitting there and what level of power it may be at. You may only have a few resets before you have to exchange well, the battery. And you it think turns that out that the reset is actually shorting the battery out because it, it pulls the voltage down to zero. Right, right, yeah. And yeah. what does that do? It it it, it empties, drains the battery. But you, you'll easily get one year out of a, a set of batteries. And like I said, the batteries are pretty inexpensive. They're multiples for a dollar each. So for two dollars, you keep your printer running. Yeah. And you're always there's no fear of any lockout. The other advantage to this and being able to have a resetter on a P600 is if you're doing an event print situation. So suppose you want to do prints at an event or you're at a fair. I have some customers who take the P600s to like a summer fair or, and they shoot photographs and print them at the fair. And they'll be doing that continually all day. So what you'll do is you will fill up and reset all your P600 tanks before you start the day. And for half a day, or maybe, you know, depending on how much business you get, you can run the whole day without touching that printer. As opposed to if you started the day with half full, three quarters full, quarter empty, you'd be attending that all through the day. And that's the last thing you want to do when you're at a fair. And you're running business, right? So, so you can just top everything off, reset it. All right. You're, start you're the day right. every morning. You start off with a fresh. Yeah, that's the practice. Full set of cartridges. Cartridges. Yeah, that's what we're doing on the Pro 100. If you're exactly remote, two sets of cartridges, always full, always 100 right. full. Not now, the other advantage of that, of course, the wasting tank. Right. Yeah. All right. But you've gone over and over again. So, yeah, between the R3000 and P600, uh, you can run an external, you know, ink wasting catcher. I have one on mine. And then I even have the uh, resetting utility for it. It's an adjustment program that just resets everything back to empty again. And so, if you are doing that kind of business where you're going to be printing, say, several hundred prints in one day, that would be a good thing to have. Make sure that you don't get that warning during your day of uh, operating. Uh, you can also use Lightroom. Lightroom has the ability to tether to your printer through your laptop. So you can have a camera tethered to the laptop, the laptop connected to the printer. Right there on the, stop, on the, on the spot live, you can shoot, process, and print without having to basically lift a finger. It's pretty neat. I've seen it done. Yeah. So, okay, so how uh, we kind of diverted off there from the R3000. Yeah, we were, you were going to talk about Chroma Optimizer. Was Did I? You want to do that, CO? I was going to talk about that. Weren't you? What were you going to talk about on the board? No, no, no. I was going to back to basics. Okay, yeah. Back to basics. You I know, know we, we discussed so many things the last call we had that, yeah. So I'm going to turn to the whiteboard. Yep. It's my makeshift whiteboard. Let me lock it in. That and yep. I hope I don't bore people I'm with this. Go ahead and uh, solo you out here. But um, we're going to go through some interesting things if we don't have enough time today, but over the time. And I'm going to tell you what I have learned about refilling and and all of that and i'm sure some vendors will look at your your videos and take some lessons to themselves but in any case let's start with cartridges um you know we know that these cartridges hold ink and there's ink and it comes out but let's let's go back to basic what happens in any cartridge well the first printers 
we had were basically something like that and it's ink in here so if you have a cartridge that is fully sealed nothing comes out correct right well we know that now if we put a little hole in there it's a tiny little hole ink can come out but after first couple drops what happens is ink doesn't come out because air can't go in if the hole is small enough okay and a print head that's those nozzles are very very tiny so if there's no way for air to go back in ink doesn't come out and the reason I, I i bring this up is that when you buy a, a canon tank you got to pull a tab and i think i have another video but the tab allows air to go in through the top here oh, okay through the top here on an epson cartridge how does air go in well, I think you've all seen these type of cartridges. So. Mike, go ahead and show everybody that. Well, let me show you. It doesn't matter what cartridge you have from Epson. Uh, you got these, this, and I'll go through the details of these cartridges in a while because it'll be fascinating, actually, if you're curious. Um, but basically, air for ink to be leaving out here air is going to go in. How does air go in on these cartridges? Well, very, very sneaky. You few, let me see here now. This is on the back side of the cartridge here. Behind here, it's actually an air filter. So air goes in through the air filter and it goes through a whole bunch of little serpentine. And it comes, and air comes through here and enters in there, right at the bottom. So let's, let's drop this for a second and go back to basics, what's going on. So if you want ink in here to be able to leave this closed container you've always got to have air going back in because it'll otherwise it'll be just as if you're trying to drink pop from a bottle and you don't allow you to go back in the bottle one or two gulps and that's it nothing's coming out yeah you create a vacuum you create a vacuum so you got to break that vacuum by allowing you to go back in okay so typically it doesn't matter where it's canon or it's Epson, they always have to allow some air to go back in. And I'm going to make a little footnote here. Only those cartridges that are not a, a bladder, okay? But even on those cartridges that are a bladder, air must go back in somehow. So for ink to go back, for air to go back in, what all the manufacturers do, whether it's Canon or Epson, they have a little hole right there that allows air to go in. Okay. Again, whether it's Canon or Epson, doesn't matter which manufacturer, there's got to be a little hole to allow air to go in. And what they typically do is they will have to have that somehow sneak back up here. And air goes in here. And tiny bubble at a time, it replaces the ink that comes out of the cartridge. Okay. So let's take that and move that into what they've done. On a Canon, they've basically done this. Same concept. You've got the sponge. You've got the outlet, you got the tank, the reservoir that's filled with liquid, and there's a tiny little opening here. 
So what happens to that opening? Well, the sponge actually pulls the ink from this reservoir out. And what happens is air comes in through the top of the cartridge and comes down here and enters into the liquid side that's sealed. This, this part here has got to be sealed airtight. So whatever comes out, air has got to go back in. And to give you an idea how that looks like, I don't know if you can see this. That's the reservoir on a Canon cartridge. And there's the opening for air to go back into the reservoir. OK, that's an old one. Here's a, let me see what else I have here. Oh, there it is. There it is, a cutaway of a CLI-8, CLI-42, same thing. Again, there's an opening there for ink to come out and air to go in. So on the Epson, how does that occur? I showed you. It comes in through on this side and comes enters from here. Okay, so the Epson, basically, this is very easy. The Epson is a little more complicated because what they do is they actually extend this into, like, the serpentine and then filter. So basically, air comes in here go through the labyrinth, serpentine, and enters the ink tank. So while it's not elongated like this, this part is flipped over on the other side. And that's why you get this. Okay, that's a regulation valve. I will go through that later. But again, the filter, air comes in through here, and there's a sheet It's very, very very thin, but I think you can see uh, with the shadows what I'm talking about. Yeah. All right? That there's something that looks somewhat like this. Can you see that? Yep. I'll, I'll, I'll do different angles so you get an idea what's behind these cartridges and if you want to see what's on the other side it's very easy so basically it's somewhat like the epson this is the ink tank area this is where ink is stored so air comes in through here at the top okay so air comes in through to this hole air comes in through there goes through the labyrinth and it enters right at the bottom here so it comes in there goes around comes back enters here then after it enters there it it basically is picked up right at the bottom here on, on this tank I don't think you can see it, but on the other side of this point, there's a little hole there that it, it picks up ink, brings it to the top in this compartment here. Ink comes through that screen and hits the print head. Similarly, Epson does the same thing too. Ink comes in through all these baffles. All these baffles are all here with ink. So air comes through. And these baffles are, it's, it's another story, but it, it's there for two reasons. One is so they can easily make different sizes, but essentially the same mold functionally. And I'll show you other things too in a, in a while. So they can actually lock out certain sections of it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like a little wall between that. Yeah. 
and give you a lower capacity cartridge. Yeah, even though the cartridge is the same the size. Same. Yeah. You know, you, a, a consumer would pick this up and go, cartridge is the same size. Why am I paying more for this other one? Yeah. Because you got a locked up bubbly in there. Fill that to capacity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Right. That's that's another trick, and uh, Canon's playing that same I identical trick as well. Yeah. Okay. So, but I'm doing this printer from the Claria days. This this cartridge, and uh, the cartridge that that was before this, that ran on your what the Epson, Joe behind you there. There's an Epson, what three forty is it? Yeah. Okay. That printer behind. Okay, that uses the one like an R200. Right. Let me see. Do you have a picture of that, that cartridge? Uh, let's see. I the got, OEM one? I got an own open. Well, you got to sacrifice it. Yeah, we're going to do it for the cost here. I'm not going to unseal it, but here it is. Yep. Okay, those cartridges were very, very complicated, more complicated than this one because those actually had a double wall on the outside. And the reason they put a double wall on the outside is because if you tried to refill it and put a plug in, you weren't able to seal the cartridge back properly and ink would leak out. In addition to that, that cartridge that Joe brought up allowed air to go in, but it even had an inlet with a, an automatic valve, that spring-operated valve, that has a hole like this. But you see, this, this cartridge here, that, that hole has no reason. But in the cartridge that Joe brought out, it actually had a poppet valve that had a plastic diaphragm, rubber diaphragm that popped open a, a, a valve and allowed air to go in so that when you remove that cartridge, from the printer, it completely sealed from the atmosphere. These other ones do not completely seal. But it was something Epson figured out after a while it wasn't necessary. And that, that extra valve they were putting in was very, very expensive for them relative to this. But one thing you can pick up right away is the relative cost of making something like this over that which yeah, one do you think costs more money to make folks it's very clear what you're yep. getting here is a lot more complications especially right? that, di that diaphragm on the opposite side yep that's a one-way check valve yeah and i and have you know how you joe you know how to bust those yeah <laughs> uh, but that was a 50 50. maybe yep. it'll work maybe it won't work um there was that was an old trick we're not even gonna bring up because it's no longer, <laughs> it's no longer it could be done, but a lot of people failed in trying to do it and they would break yeah. even the syringes. It would ruin a lot of a lot of cartridges that way. Yeah. So right. I know what most people want to know is uh, and ask is that are these fantastic engineering designs of these cartridges, the engineering that goes into designing one of these cartridges. Was it all done to provide us, the consumer, with the most reliable ink flow? Or was it also having to do with preventing us from refilling? Because Canon is very liberal about, you know, their designs. I can refill just about any car Canon cartridge I have. I may not be able to reset the chip, but that's another story. But, yeah, they've made it very easy to refill these scanning cartridges, why has Epson gone through, you know, these extremes of design? I mean, look at the the maze of channels and chambers that you have no clue. The regular Joe Blow looks at that and says, what the hell is going on here? You can't even follow the, the pathway of the ink because you literally have that side and then you have the other side also involved in some way with you know venting and this valve does this and that was it all for the good of the consumer to to provide us with the best ink flow possible or was it to prevent us from refilling 
Okay, I'll answer that one. I, I'm not an Epson engineer, but in reverse engineering what they've done, I would say it was twofold. It was both to give the best situation for the printer and had a different uh, aspect as well, which is to make it more difficult to refill. Because the, the cartridge you showed earlier, Joe, if unfortunately I I had one disassembled and I took it apart many years ago, and then I think a couple of years I said, a couple of years ago I said, these printers don't even exist anymore. I just cleared out my room and threw it away. I, I looked, searched high and low for it yesterday. I couldn't find it. But you'll find that it, it was an even more intricate aspect. And I did discover a way years ago how to refill them very, very easily. Yeah. All right? And after I discovered that, uh, it, it, it basically, there was a couple weak points that Epson had had when I looked at the design that I had a back door to do it. You had to tilt it. You had to drill at a certain spot just where they had kind of design error. I wouldn't, or weakness. And they had another spot that had a design weakness. And you could actually simply fill it back with ink if you knew how to do it mm -hmm. and which spots to fill it from. Mm -hmm. After I figured that out, years later, I discovered what Epson had done was they had changed one of the baffle inside that allowed that to be done properly and changed it in a different way so it trapped air that it couldn't be done anymore. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're very, very good engineers as far as preventing refilling as best as they can, as well as um, designing cartridges to give good flow to the Epson printer. Now, the reason why they have to do this is because the Epson printhead, it's tough, it's durable, but it's very sensitive to ink flow issues as well. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, on this cartridge here, what you will find in, on most like cartridges, you will find that if you fill this with ink, ink will be used up here, and the as you use it up, ink will fall. And at the end, you've got ink at the bottom half. Epson does it the opposite way. They use the ink up from the bottom half first, and in the end, ink is left at the top half. And that way, they've got a more consistent pressure arrangement to the printhead. So, yeah, it, it does provide a better engineered solution to the printer than an aftermarket like this. But the aftermarkets can work within the window that the printhead wants. Mm -hmm. But this is optimized. Okay. Do we see, I haven't seen any real significant differences between something like this and this in terms of reliability. So perhaps Epson was over-engineering it, as best I can tell. Now, you've got these aftermarkets, and you've also got these other easy-fill aftermarkets, like this one. These need priming. These don't need priming because when you put the ink in, it simply goes to the bottom and it's ready to flow out. But if you notice, there's a pool of ink at the top here. And at, in the end, there's a pool of ink in this chamber. And eventually, the ink comes lower than the screen. Why is this better? Because at the top here, you've got a reservoir of ink all is ready to follow down into the printhead. So when the printhead needs a quick, heavy dose of ink, like in a head clean, 
it's more likely to get a more reliable flow of ink in there through the to the print head than this because if you have very little ink left in here and you do a head cleaning you can get air going into the print head and causing what many people think are clogs but it's basically air going into the print head being sucked in through the cartridge so generally i don't like these because these do a better job but from a, a consumer standpoint, they prefer these because you don't need priming. But technically, these are better, but you need priming. So same old story. You don't get something for nothing. All right? Yeah, so, I think it makes life easier for the consumer, the initial installation, if they don't really know how to properly prime. Yeah, they don't understand what priming is. They don't, right. Because if you, if you get a brand new cartridge that needs priming, you just put ink in. You're wondering why you got no ink in your print head and why it's nothing is printing. Now let's take a look at these two cartridges, Mike. So I have a T58 here, mm -hmm. 3880, 3800. Then I got a replacement refillable cartridge. And structurally, this actually has more structure, internal structure than this. This is just an ink bag that connects to an ex exit port that neither allows ink to come in, but allows ink to go out. So it's a one-way valve. And then there's a venting system that allows air to flow as the ink bag it is being depleted of ink. But the ink is never exposed to the air like in one of these here. See, the, the ink is con it's just sitting inside this plastic box with a few support baffles and it's got a priming chamber and air literally contacts the ink this keeps the ink away from air um i think this design is quite simple and easy to uh, to bypass as far as uh, being able to refill it but there can be nothing easier than this mike our the pro 1000 cartridge that's got to be the simplest, as well as the uh, Pro 300. And hopefully, hopefully, the Pro 1, I mean, the Pro 10, and hopefully the Pro 300. Keep your finger. Well, I happen to have one of those as well right here, and that's the Pro 10. Yep. Chrome Optimizer. But guess what? These are, as, as I showed last time, these are a diaphragm cartridges. Mm -hmm. just like the OEM Epson one. This one actually has an air inlet. It's right, I think, at this corner right here. Okay, so as the diaphragm goes in, air has to, to enter the cartridge. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, some people will end up trying to wash these cartridges and get water all over the place. Yeah, they get water will... inside the... Um inside the actual um, area where the uh, diaphragm lies. I've seen, yep. I've seen that. That's yeah. what I was about to say. Right. Try not to get water in there because if you get a film of water in there, when you f when the diaphragm is, 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 is comes right back against this plate, if water is trapped in there, you get a suction effect and you can get ink flow issues. Mm -hmm. So whenever you work with these cartridges, Try as best as you can not to get water behind this yeah, plate. Don't the cartridges this, this corner here is most critical. Right here. That's where the air infiltrates the cartridge. It's, it's a very, very tiny crack. It's like they did not put glue or something there and just enough to allow a slow leakage of air in. But so, so don't don't run them under the faucet, please. Yeah, don't run them under the faucet. Uh, air, uh, water tension is a very, very strong, um, what? It's a big <laughs> force. Is, yeah. Huge force. Yeah. You can, you could take two pieces of glass, put some water on it, squeeze them together and you can lift both pieces without them coming apart. Water yeah. tension, that, that little diaphragm will not be able to operate if you get just a little film of water in there. Yeah, and that'll give you ink flow issues, and you're wondering why you're, you're streaking, and it's not working if you washed it. So be careful when you use these and you wash them. 
I don't see any time you have to actually wash these out no. at any point in time. Okay, yeah. so if you have to wash these out, something's gone wrong. And again, I advise people that they should not buy these used unless they're absolutely sure they've never been abused and let dry. Because the OEM ink, when it dries on these cartridges, or not so much on the CO, but on the other colors, it dries really hard. And it's you're not going to be able to easily yeah. wash that out. And yeah, clear it. Do you have anything in there right now? That CO. Yeah, this has CO in it. Okay, all right. Chrome optimizer. Not, well, Keith Keith Cooper calls this color optimizer, but yeah. it's really chroma yeah. optimizer. Remember what you told me quite a while ago, and this is this is what I'm talking about. That port. Yeah. So that that's kind of like a sponge type material. They said a porous material, right? Porous felt material. So if if you have a cartridge from eBay that came, the user threw away the orange clip. Never throw away your orange clips, okay? Never. They're very useful. You can make adapters for flushing your cartridges that they needed. You can make an adapter to collapse that that diaphragm before you try to refill it, especially from these used cartridges that someone used. And they had no intention ever of refilling. They're selling them off for five bucks each. And you have no clue why ink cannot get in. That'll happen. Uh, Mike, I just, the other night, in fact, last night, I took, uh, yesterday, I took my, uh, day before yesterday, I took my grandson out. He wanted to use my DSLR. He's eight. So he says, uh, I want to learn photography. And then that just got me here because I was exactly that age when the bug bit me. And so, of course, I got in the car, drove over there. We went out in the woods and took lots of pictures. And then he says, Grandpa, can you print the best one? So I printed about 30 some odd pictures and put them in a little bag and gave them to my wife today to give to him after the uh, first communion service. Anyway, so <laughs> I realized, no wait, I realized I was running out of inks. I said, oh, shoot. So I, I stopped printing. And I had a set already filled and ready to go, popped them in, took out the ones that were all, all kinds of different levels, and I started to refill them. And some of them had air in them. I had to squeeze the sides, and you saw nothing but foam coming out. That can happen, too. Yeah. Foam will, foam will not allow ink to enter. So I had to milk that one. I had to literally squeeze blot the foam off, add a little bit more ink, let go, and, and continue until I reach the proper weight. What a pain in the you-know-what that was. And that's because that cartridge came from a pile of uh, cartridges that I got from someone that had no orange clip on them. They had been allowed to dry and were in terrible shape. And luckily enough, I didn't have any actual problems printing with it. But, yeah. Okay. So... We've basically gone through basically how air enters the printer. So the last thing I was saying was that Epson does a, a fantastic job of, of emptying the bottom first, leaving it at the top, thereby giving a more even pressure arrangement to the regulating valve as opposed to the aftermarkets, which allow ink to drop to the bottom and then have to lift more ink up. But despite that, they seem to work well as well. Okay, now let me go to the next part and history and story of chips. Mm -hmm. Chips, chips, chips. Okay. Because the chips and Canon and chips and Epson is going to become a very interesting topic for us. And why did Epson have chips before Canon did? And here's the story as best I can tell, because it all started before I started printing, I'm sure, in the design room. The biggest problem or the biggest enemy of an Epson printer is air. Air, air, air. Because the way an Epson printer works is like this. Um, Let 
No, let's let's do it a different way. Uh, as you can see, I'm doing this on the fly. Okay. Epson printers work by literally squeezing ink out like you would squeeze ink out of a tube or anything. Basically, it, it basically quickly squeezes, ink shoots out, squeezes, ink shoots out, squeezes, ink shoots out. So I'm sure we've done that before. You're talking about how it creates a droplet of ink, right? Yes. Yeah. It squeezes, okay. it literally pumps the ink out by squeezing the ink. So what happens is this, is that this is the nozzle on an Epson. This is very simplified, people. So all those perfectionists and really sticklers, yeah, yeah, it's not a, exactly how it, it looks. Be careful, don't make it look like some human parts. What's that? That's my no, stomach. No, what are you talking I, I about? Know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, ink comes in. It goes into a nozzle chamber. Then this nozzle chamber basically squeezes. Ink shoots out. Okay, and it does this, what, hundreds of thousand times or a million times a second or whatever. It's fast. It just quick, 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 quick. It just keeps squeezing. Now, when it squeezes, it has a back pressure on the ink. And it has an exit. So what happens? It always chooses the path of least resistance. So when you squeeze on it, if there's back pressure, it doesn't want to go back into the cartridge. And it's going back to the cartridge on top. I'll call it the tank. Okay, squeezes, does it, the ink can't go back there. It's too much resistance because when liquid wants to travel fast, you get very high resistance because of turbulent flow, et cetera, et cetera. But basically, it comes out the nozzle instead. So that, that's how an Epson printer works, okay? What happens is if you get air in here, and it squeezes, what happens? You can squeeze air. Air is compressible. It's like a balloon. If you try to squeeze water in a bag, the bag bursts or it pops a leak somewhere. So whenever you get air in here, you get the so-called classic Epson clog. People think that the printer is clogged. Oh God, it's clogged. Most of the times, over 95% of the times, or even 99, it, 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 there's no blockage. It just has some air in here. And if you got air, you squeeze it, it, ha it air just does nothing. It's, it's compressible. So nothing happens, and you, your, your prints don't print. Your nozzle check is bad, and you're wondering what the heck is going on. It's clogged. You also, uh, so when that happens, let me clear this, or you clear it up for me. When you're squeezing that chamber and there's nothing but air, what happens to the liquid ink that's behind that? Nothing. It just cannot Nothing. Flow. It just sits there. It sits there. So it, it comes across as a physical clog, meaning? Well, we, we never, we've never seen a clog physically. We just right. we, we just keep thinking that if something doesn't print, it's, it you must see, be blocked. Yeah, people will categorize it as having dried up ink. There, right? It's so the easiest like way to explain it. With cholesterol, so it's not yeah. really a clog. Yeah, it's the easiest way for consumers to buy it up to suck it up. Mm. Because if you try to imagine tech support telling people this situation that they don't have a clog. What do you mean? My printer doesn't print. It's got a clog, right? Mm -hmm. So all these years, we've always been clogs, clogs, clogs. But what's what's really going on with these clogs is air. So if you don't prime your tanks and you get air in there, it, nothing's going to print, right? 
It's filled with air. That's why we got a prime. But why do Epson printers typically, after no printing for a few days or a week or so, not print? Well, if you look at the nozzle, Let's imagine this is the print head. Again, it's not exactly how it's constructed, mm -hmm. but it's only to illustrate the idea. Okay? So that's like a, you're doing a cross section. Yeah, this is ink. Yeah. It's a cross section, and ink is sitting right on the opening of the nozzle. So if you look at it from the top, there's a little hole there. Okay? So that's basically a nozzle here. And ink is just sitting ready at the bottom of the nozzle at the outlet. Now, we've talked about liquid. And I think people will know this if you look at um, even the syringe. If you just fill up a small cylinder, you'll find that in that cylinder, there's a shape of liquid. That looks like this. It basically climbs on the edge, right? The same thing happens at the, the, the here. Okay, there's liquid here, and it's basically held across the hole. So as the printer sits there, no matter what you do, this is always continually slowly drying out. Now, as soon as this thing dries out a little bit and this film that's stretched across the opening breaks down, what happens is as it breaks down and reforms, you get tiny little bubbles that goes into the printhead. Over time, those bubbles accumulate enough that when the nozzle wants to work its magic, it becomes too compressible and it won't print. Now, every time you start an Epson up, it's got to go through a priming cycle, and that's what that priming cycle does. It tries to get rid of any air that's been ingested while it's been resting. Okay? Yep. And that's what happens when you do a head clean. You basically suck out the whole nozzle trying to pull out air and ink when you do a head clean. Do uh, please clarify whether a head clean process procedure uses pressure or vacuum? Vacuum. Vacuum from where? Vacuum from a pump on the bottom side. And I did not bring my parking station up. I actually had one disassembled downstairs. Yes. And I, I can show that at another show, but it's it'll take too long for me to run down and get it and bring it back up. Yeah, but basically, uh, it, it, it's a cup that comes on, and that this cup has a hose to a pump, a vacuum pump, a type of pump called a peristaltic pump. Mm -hmm. And this parking station comes up to the nozzle, it does its thing, and it sucks. So, so it, while it sucks, it, it pulls the ink out of the nozzle. Hopefully, air as well, and reestablishes an all liquid nozzle chamber. Now, let me let me add a bit of a. Um, this happened to me uh, a few years ago with my older thirty eight hundred. I was getting some chronic, but randomly randomly changing clogs missing nozzles in my nozzle check on my cyan channel doesn't really matter what color it was and i would perform a cleaning cycle and then run another nozzle check and it would be about the same number of nozzles missing but different ones so it, i i came to the point where i was about to pull the last three hairs off my head and then i realized Wait a minute. How is how does how does a cleaning cycle really work? Vacuum. And how do you apply vacuum to the printhead to suck out ink by sealing that gasket on the 
yeah, so called That's a seal parking station or the the perch pad, whatever you want to call it. So I open up my lid, get a flashlight. I took a look in there. It looked like like dried up mud after a after a flood. Yeah, it was caked up with cruddy looking dried up chunky ink. I whipped out my long Q tips and some Q uh, some uh, uh, Windex, cleaned up that crap off of that sponge. The sponge, I mean the uh, gasket. Got it nice and spanky clean. Started again, ran a nozzle check after my cleaning cycle, 100% flowing. It was due to a sealing or not sealing gasket. So it was sort of touching passively, but it couldn't generate enough vacuum to perform the proper level of cleaning that you know I needed in this case. So clean that peripheral gasket on your on your um sponge if you will your your perch pad and that will keep that nice and clean unless it becomes physically damaged like split or cracked which is hardly ever going to happen because i i think it's made out of silicone you know that will maintain that cleaning cycle process working at 100 percent, so you don't run into problems when when the printer is trying to uh, clear out any air that may infiltrate nozzles and you think they're clogs. Your your cleaning cycle will be useless if you cannot generate the vacuum you need, you see? So it's just something I learned and, you know, it, it took me uh, probably a day and a half to figure it out. So now you guys know. <laughs> well, there's another side to that because the 3800, 3880P800 is a... Uh... Is a pressurized system, and yeah. it's very interesting because people will say that their 3800, 3880, P800 hardly ever clogs, and they're correct. So what's going on? They also use the same sort of nozzle as well. So what's going on? Hang on, Mike. Here's the uh, pressurization stem. All or, right. Let me move it right there. That right. little bigot right there? That's where air enters right. the tank to keep that bag pressurized at the correct level. Right. So here's what's going on on the 3880, which is very different from like the R3000, P600, and normal desktops, because those use a pressurized system. With a pressurized system, if you happen to have a nozzle that has air here, Okay, guess what happens? If this has got pressure, it basically, the whole column of ink comes down, and guess what happens? It squeezes that air out. And that's the reason why 3880s and P800s and 3800s very rarely develop bad nozzle checks even after resting for quite a while because as soon as you turn that printer on or you go to print and it pressurizes the system, any air that infiltrated gets pushed back out very quickly. Okay? So that's a very nice category. That's If you want the most reliable Epson printer, you get a pressurized system. So is it worth getting a P800 over P600 if you don't print a, a lot? It might be. Because yeah. it's, you know, because of that, that, that pressure regulating, that pressurized system aspect is going to help the irregular printing guy a lot. I know so, I have left my 3080 for two, three, four months and turn it on, no problem. And before the pressurized system, that's unheard of in an Epson printer. 2400, 2100, 2880. You can't pull those kind of intervals off. Yeah, so they all use these internal ink bags that are pressurized. So like he showed you when he when he dismantled one of those cartridges, there is an inner foil that covers the internal space. That bag sits inside that, and the pressurization takes place outside of that space, and it pushes against the bag. Now... Why hasn't Canon large format printers 
uh, adopted such a such a um, type of design because these are not pressurized. No, but Canon did do it. Oh, Joe, Joe oh, Canon yeah. did do it. Yeah, at one time did they? Yeah, the Pro One. Okay, yeah, the Pro One, of course, sure. It's got an. And what happened there? Yeah, what did it was not a good scene, was it? Yeah. Right, but Canon does a different trick. Now, Canon does not have as big a hole as Epson does in your nozzles, but they have a lot more nozzles. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, as a result of that, the when you have a tiny hole and you got liquid in it, compared to a big hole and you got liquid in it, what happens? The tiny hole with the liquid in it does not have as much breakdown because of the surface tension effects as opposed to a big hole with liquid in it, as in an Epson nozzle and a Canon nozzle. You know, the relative sizes might be different, but it's just to illustrate the fact that an Epson nozzle is much bigger and larger than a Canon nozzle. So the, the breakdown effects of the liquid across the hole in the nozzle is much, much less on a Canon than it is on an Epson. Mm. So as a result of that, you know, you talked about surface tension. The surface tension pull on this Canon can be quite large. So what Canon does on, on their large format printers, if you want to compute pressurized systems, is they do this. They have what? They have print head, tank. That's inside the printer. And they've got a tank here that's outside the printer. And the mechanism they have is that ink will leak out and fill the tank inside the printer. And this is dipped in that tank in there all the time. Mm. So Canon uses more of a siphon effect to continually feed its printhead. That's why the internal tank is integral to the design on the Pro 1000, 2000, et cetera, and mm -hmm. the bigger wide format printers. Yeah. They do it a different way. And this is the way the actual Pro 1000 works. They actually have sensors that sense the ink level in the internal tanks. Okay. So if the tank reaches a certain level, it knows. Well, let me explain this. As you print, this tank, the ink level drops as ink is consumed. As the ink level drops, it's refilled back to a specified level by the external tank. Whether it's a wide format tank like this, this, right or the one you brought out like on the pro 1000 basically ink is continually fed right ink exits that port and it's continually fed to this tank and that tank connects by a siphon system to the printhead all right so what happens? How does the Pro 1000 know it's run out of ink? And you asked this, Joe, when your tank was empty, it's absolutely empty. How the heck does it know? There's no sensors in it? You know, show, show, show your viewers that tank on the Pro 1000 again, Joe. There's no chips on it except for that chip, which is detached. Right. From the ink tank. How the heck does it know? Connected. 
Right. Just float. It, it just floats. It doesn't have no any sensors on the ink tank. So how does the printer know it's run out of ink? Well, let's just see what happens. As it's printing, the ink level in this internal tank drops. If the tank has ink, it refills this internal tank and the level remains the same. So the minute this runs out, the ink level, when you print, starts dropping on the internal tank and it's got a level sensor in there. So when this level sensor says, when it's dropped to the point it triggers the low level sensor here in the tank, it knows this must have run out of ink. Make sense? Yeah, are, are you saying that the levels are basically continually kept up or replenished, or does yeah. it have to reach a certain as you print? No, as you print, it's continually replenishing that internal ink tank. How does it prevent um, ink from this cartridge to just flood into that secondary tank? Is there is there a valve between this port? ink line into or whatever it uses you know that you, you that, know what I'm saying? that is the gotta be some way some way to stop this because all this is is a container it has nothing in it right. really it doesn't and how the do same I way it is this is an oem yeah large format uh, tank and it's very simple just two holes right a tube and that's it Right. So the internal tank reaches a threshold that says, hey, I'm low. Please provide more ink, more ink to bring me back to my normal. No, the, the internal tank actually doesn't do it electronically. It's done right. mechanically. There's got to be a way to keep this from stop over. Right. That's the that's the question I haven't figured out yet until I take apart my Pro 1000, which oh. ain't happening right now. <laughs> really? But I can tell you this. Remember last year I attempted to put a continuous ink system on the 1000? Yeah. I failed. That's when I figured out that the the mechanism they use is actually quite precise. Yeah. They have figured out all the pressures required to fill, to have that thing feed in without overflowing. And it's done mechanically. Because, hold on, folks who are here tonight. You may not know what the hell we were planning on doing with the Pro 1000. We were going to turn it into a continuous external uh, ink system. Yep. That you could then disable ink monitoring, not worry about chips except for color recognition, and just feed ink. And all we had to monitor would be the external tanks. Oh, this one's getting low. Just pour some ink in. I'm not the brightest, uh, the shiniest light in the attic. Mike is, and he failed. He thought that we both thought this would work. We couldn't come up with any reason why this would not work. Well, the Canon Pro 1000 has some tricks up its sleeves, apparently. Yeah, it, it looks like it's completely mechanical, and um, it started to have the ink kept emptying in here, and you couldn't stop it. So it was very, very precisely balanced. So um, I'm going to say, you know, if you want a 1,000, stick with the OEM tanks for a reason. Now, for the same reason, I mean, these aftermarket tanks for the Pro 2000, 4,000, et cetera, you fill them by unscrewing the cap, sticking ink in there, putting the cap back on after you you orient it. Wait, did you just unscrew that like a bottle? Yeah. Oh, my God. Oops. Let me put the washer back on. And But, but what I haven't figured out yet is... Excuse me. I just burped. <laughs> What I haven't figured out yet, this these is tanks do not have, what do you see in there? I thought we decided that was some sort of a 
vent tube or something that would help agitate ink internally? I don't think it's agitation anymore. No? No. Because I haven't little, figured out exactly what this thing little, does. Little holes all around. Yeah. The, uh, the, now the, that you've seen it, I will remove it. And you can see the little holes in it. Yeah. Can you see it? Barely. It's kind of blurry. But yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, yeah you can see the holes in it. Right. It's got, now, if you look at the holes carefully, they're not spaced evenly. Mm. See it? Yeah. This one is closer to this one than this one. These are about spaced. These are spaced evenly. Now, the other interesting thing about that is it's it's placed right below this this separator here. Mm -hmm. See that that separating thing that 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 wall. Mm -hmm. Now, in that wall, there's two gaps here and here, right? And it sits right there, just right below there. My my initial thought is that that's there to better help the ink regulation system inside the printer. That same mechanism here. Mm -hmm. All right. That mechanism of feeding to the in internal tanks. I think that actually aids it in some fashion by having some more distinct pressure steps. Mm -hmm. Um. Exactly what it's doing, I, I don't know. I'm not a Canon but, engineer. Yeah, the uh, dual port on the end of the, the cartridge, isn't that performing a dual Yes, action? one it, allows you in and one allows ink out. Right. That way the internal, because there's no way to vent that otherwise. That's right. And we were talking about how do we vent these? Isn't this the spigot that the male spigot that enters the port also performs the venting? Yeah. So that air is actually entering as ink is actually exiting. Yeah. So it's, it's literally like, like dripping I, out. Yeah. It's more like dripping out. It's just brilliant. Yeah. All right. So it's 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 not as physically complicated as no, as a pressurized system is. Yeah. All right, so it's, it's they've retained what they think is is a simplistic system, but it has its intricacies. Mm -hmm. And as long as they've figured it out, I'm sure they have. They've got a, a, a different system running. So there is there's a difference between an OEM. I mean, you look at this thing and you go, just a plastic tank, right? Right. And an aftermarket. Just a plastic tank. Mm -hmm. Can't be any different. Well, there are some small differences. Now, while I'm here, I'm going to show you something else here as well. I don't have the head on this. But on the white format machines, you notice the shape, the slots? Those are keys. Yeah. Keyways, yeah. Those keyways are to make sure you don't stick a red into a blue or a cyan into a magenta right those keyways are all different to make sure you don't stick it in the wrong slot no keyways on this one you can you no, can aftermarkets don't have keyways because have it's, keyways. it's meant for one mold to fit oh, on all positions all right the epson cartridge has keyways Yep. All right. Those are keyways. Now, so that's how Canon determines how much ink is left in the white format. So let's go back to the origins of the chip, Joe. Why a chip? Well, first off, the first printers we owned were all little sponge cartridges that stuck into the printers. And when the printer started to print fuzzy, we knew, oh, time to get a new cartridge, right? Mike, didn't Epson initially use a sponge-type cartridge? Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. My uh, my eight hundred or eight eight eighty did. Right. Right. They used a very simple sponge cartridge and and I ran to refilling issues very quickly with that because I got foam in the sponge and I could never get a good nozzle check. Mm -hmm. But then they went from that to a patterned spongeless cartridge, somewhat similar to this for the R200. And then they got into a lawsuit because people figured out that there was still ink left in the cartridge when Epson said cartridge was empty. Took them to court, and they lost. Now, why did Epson leave a lot of ink in the cartridge, even when it said it was empty? The key word is AIR, air. Remember, we, 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 I showed how the Epson nozzle worked? Mm -hmm. You get air in there. Number one, it's hard to clear if you get too much of it in there. So if your cartridge empties while it's printing and you get air in there, you got to do a whole bunch of nozzle cleans or head cleans to, to, to pull all the air out so you can get a good nozzle check. So they were always erring on the side of being conservative to make sure that their cartridges never ran out of ink so that when they change a the cartridge, they don't have air in the system. If they allowed the cartridge to run empty and use all the ink out before changing the cartridge, there would be times when the chip would say, you still got ink left and you got none because the consumption of a cartridge on an Epson, when I've tested them, can vary as much as 20% in real terms between when it says it's empty and it's full. Mm -hmm. Not full, empty, and what's left in there. So if you measure the amount of ink left in there multiple times after you've refilled it, and when it says it's empty, you can get as high a variation of 20%. That's a lot of ink, right? And that's right. apparently what Epson was doing, because they knew the variation in the amount of ink actually consumed as opposed to what the chip says can vary as much as 20%. They can't take it down to 5% because they would get into trouble too many times. Right. So the engineer said 20% is where we're pretty sure no consumers are ever going to get air into the head because they ran out of ink, even though the chip says they got ink. Mike Holder Moore, to quote, uh, yeah, was off, yeah, off frame. There you go. Okay. So Epson lost that lawsuit. Because all these consumers told them, you're ripping us off. And, of course, you try to explain this technically to most consumers and the court and lawyers. It's, yeah. All right, so they lost it. The judge didn't buy it. Yeah. Okay. That's too bad. So, <laughs> well, it's too bad because what it did yeah. was it then initiated something called an escalation in chips. Now, at the same time, let's compare Epson and Canon. At the same time, Canon was selling BCI-6 printers, chipless. Right. And those cartridges use the optical prism. Let me get one here, the optical prism. I think you've talked about this before. I've talked about that's that little prism there. Let me show it to you in a clear one. That's that little, see that reflective little thing here? Initially, when this thing ran down and there was no more ink left, Canada would declare empty. But in fact, it was the sponge still had ink in there. They kept very quiet about it. Mm. Because remember, Canon was not a big seller of printers at that time. Epson was the Goliath. They were the giant. You're off the frame again with the cartridge. There you go. Okay. Yep. So, so Epson was the big guy in the room. So they went after Epson. Right after Epson lost that lawsuit, 
what it can and do. They put a chip in. Mm -hmm. Now, Canon also has the same issue. The amount of ink that the printer actually consumes versus what is actually left in there can vary quite a bit. So what does Canon do? Well, we all know this prism can detect how much ink is in there. We got a chip that can count down based on the head activity, print head activity, all right? But one thing that Canon had for it is that the amount of ink left in the sponge at all time is fairly predictable, especially with the dual layer sponge. So what they did was that they had the chip count down, but as soon as the chip counted down a certain amount, the optical prism started to look to see whether or not there's any ink left. As soon as the optical prism sees that there is ink gone, it knows precisely how much ink is left in the sponge. Because at that point, it's very predictable. At that point, they can count down to empty and they're gonna be pretty precise how much ink is left in there. But you have to make sure that, well, this system cannot allow that sponge to completely lose. In other words, people want to squeeze out the last drop of ink out of their cartridges. Well, they can. Remember, it, Canon allows you that override. Right, but I mean, that can be a bit dangerous when you're dealing with a thermal type printhead rather than an Epson cold fire. Well, not to the average consumer. Right, yeah. Not, yeah, of course. By the way, um, so you guys know, everybody out there, this is just like an Ep like a Epson P800 cartridge. If I pay $60 for this and I use it until the chip absolutely set, tells me, hey, you're empty, I'm throwing away, oh, let's say, 80 ml of ink divided into $60, that's $0.75 per milliliter of ink. I will have 10, 10 ml of ink inside this ink bag that I will be dropping in the trash. That's 10 times 75 cents, $7.50 every time you throw away one of these cartridges. Let's take the ink out of it by removing it from the port with your syringe. It's a plain tip syringe will work. And then use that ink, put it in a bottle. That's what I do. I've been collecting ink out of these empty cartridges forever now. And I amassed tons of uh, OEM ink to refill my 38, my 2880 smaller printer, and also my R3000. That's how I use OEM inks, okay? Without having to pay through the nose. So anyways, Joe, again, Joe, that, that, that illustrates how variable the ink tanks and how much of a leeway they've got to reserve because if you look at that ink tank, there's no way you can monitor ink, especially if it's in a bag. Now, Canon have clever engineers because here I have a Pro 1 cartridge. That's also a seal system. Okay. Um, yeah, here it is. Let me get something to open it. What's the matter with me today? Hey, Mike, I have one here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I, I just want to make sure yeah. people don't think I'm... They want to show you. You crack that open? Yeah. Yep. There it is. It's a bladder, just like the, um, the 3880, right? Right. But it has an ink detection system in it. So how the heck does it do it? 
Here it is. Um, first, I want to explain this. This is what I call a serial single port connection. In that port is a single hole, and that single hole both feeds ink, allows ink to go in, and air to come in to replace the cartridge. The air that comes out. So this thing can allow, can go swell up and go back down, okay? Otherwise, this whole cartridge here is completely sealed because it's pressurized. All right, so there's a little thing here. And what it is, it's this thing. It's like a little paddle. That's that little thing there. And this, my friend, detects when the bag collapses onto this clear paddle. So optically, the Pro One can tell when there's ink left and when it's empty. Not perfect, but it's still away. Because remember on the Canon printer, if you run it dry, you can kill the printhead. So Canon knows that. And they've got to take ways of trying to determine when it's safe, up to what point it's safe and not safe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is one pressurized system Canon did try in the Pro One. The Pro One, as we know, was not hugely successful, and it's kind of problematic. It was not a great printer from Canon. Had a lot of promise. So... There's that ink detection. There's a Pro 1, Pro 10. But let's look at the Pro 10. The chip has no connection to the ink inside because, look, it's it's got a little double wall there. There's no sensors whatsoever. There's no prisms. Normally a prism would be there. No prisms. And there can't be a prism because it's got a bladder going in and out. That's in that whole place there. So Canon had to try to develop a cartridge that would be very, very precise. And they could pretty much, within a certain window, know it's not going to empty out on them when they say the chip is empty. And that's the reason why the, the, the Pro 10... Pro 9500 and the new Pro 300 cartridges retain the same design because it was a very lengthy process for them to basically fine tune this little cartridge here where it was very predictable. So it has no sensor. So it, it, it leaves ink in there, just like the 3880 when it says it's empty, just as a safety measure to make sure you never run out of ink and destroy the head. Now, after Canon, uh, Epson lost that lawsuit, remember I told you that Canon developed this chip, allowed you to use more ink out of the sponge to the point where people were happy if it was said empty, it's empty, and that was it. Epson had a problem. How do I prevent the printhead from going dry yet fulfill the demands by the law that says I got to allow the, the consumer to use all the ink from the cartridge. So what they did was they developed this first model. Okay, this was the first cartridge out of the first generation Claria machines. It's very complicated, air filter, serpentine, Regulation valve, <clears throat> ink used up from the bottom, but it had a sensor. If you look carefully, okay, is it going to get it focused for us? No. Uh, this cheap webcam is not doing the trick, but you can see there's a couple connections there. Right at the tip here. Yeah. Right. Those connections went back to the chip, which was connected 
to the front here like this. And it led to two pads on the connections. So the printer itself would start measuring resistances across the ink. So ink would flow, and the last bit of ink to be used would come through this, this chamber here before it went to the regulation valve. So Epson considered that the regulation valve still had to be filled with ink because it never wanted the printer to run dry, but it had to be make sure that the rest of the cartridge was completely empty of ink. And they did that by having two sensors just prior to it going in to the regulation valve. You look at that, the sensor, you can tell it's not cheap. A lot of stuff going on there that they got to put in there to make sure they don't get sued. That lasted for quite a bit. Then they came out with a different design. You see, you notice that the cartridge is now evolving a little bit. Even though on the outside it may look the same, on the inside it's still evolving. The designs, they're fine-tuning. This area is a little bit different. That's to tune the amount of ink that they claim is inside. Notice here it's different from here. They also changed how the chip, the detection of the ink in the final chamber. They went from, a, this has no more, see these metal tabs? The newer cartridge does not have them. Okay, and all this is, all these things here is to make sure the cartridges have no more ink in them. Now, what happened as well is as soon as the cartridge is detected, there's no more ink, what would it do? It would burn the chip out. I think, Joe, you've seen that before? Yep. Right. It would burn the chip out, can't reset, can't use. But it would, well, it wouldn't completely, yeah, it can't use. It's empty. It's gone. But they went from this design of an insertion, which is a more expensive piece, to something that they could fabricate outside and just plastic weld in, in place. And this was more reliable than this because this could be made more precisely for less money. So the Epson cartridge is a very expensive thing for Epson to make relative to Canon. And it's all because of that lawsuit they lost. And they're fulfilling their premise of giving you all the ink you can use from the Epson cartridge. They went from this to this. What's notable in this? A couple things. One is, this one is, by, by the way, a T252 of the workforce series, they went into a prism. So instead of making or fabricating a very precise sort of a ceramic device here to detect the resistance across ink, they migrated to a prism. What does this prism do? Well, when there's ink, it doesn't reflect. When there's no ink, it reflects. So it knows right away whether or not there's ink left. So the way this cartridge works is that the last bit of ink is, is here. It's then sucked up into the regulation chamber and then into your printer. So when this is out, it's completely out of ink. So they've cost reduced this and this to the point where there's no sensor on the chip anymore. The chip is completely isolated from the ink. As opposed to this generation, it's actually in touch with the ink. Same with this one. It's actually sensing the ink. 
now it's no longer sensing the ink. It's it's content that once this is empty, it's empty. But they didn't stop there. Just like these, when it detected no ink, it would destroy the chip. This would do the same. But the aftermarket, people would always run out of ink, had to fix this somehow. So what they do is they block out they black out the prism mm -hmm. or else the printer would destroy the chip when they, a person ran out of ink. Wow. <laughs> right? So they've been continually cost reducing because they know this is costing them money. They sell millions and millions of these. Every penny counts. So they, they've cost reduced it to this. And then on the expression series, They've come down to this. They figured they'd use a bladder system. This is the handle to allow air to go in there. But on this one here, on the bladder system, if you get any air inside this chamber and so you're drawing air out, you notice that slope? Mike, Awfully difficult up. to get it out, man. Slide over to the left a little bit. You're off to the right. There you go. Yeah. Prism. So notice the slope. It drains all the ink from the cartridge right down to the prism. Mm -hmm. So as soon as the prism detects no ink, it's out. Right? And guess what there? You get air in there. But anyways, but the key thing is cost reduction, cost reduction, cost reduction, and they've come down to this. These are in the new expression series. Very tough. Not only did they have this to burn out the chip, uh, when I bought the XP600, at first these were very nice printers because you could refill them with the bladder just like you did on the Net Pro 10. They started their escalation of the chip game. First chips were very good. Firmware update, they got blasted. Second chip change, they got blasted again. I guess I, at some point it's, you know, the firmware wars. Um, but this is what it's come down to. And that's a quick lesson on wow. chips and why they're there and they're there to Protect the printer. Designs are there to protect Epson. And we refillers have to try to outsmart them. Yeah. And That's we've done it for a while, but. Before guys, I let you go, because it's been about two hours you've been on here. Can yeah. you, you fill us in as to a lot of people are asking about the Epson, I believe it's a, a, a um, 15,000. Right, artisan fifteen thousand. I haven't supported the artisan fifteen thousand because yeah. I knew right from the start, get go, it would be a nightmare because it's going to be a chip war, and they've allowed the fifteen thousand to be refillable with, not refillable, that you can have third party cartridges for it mm -hmm. with single use chips. The chips. I've been checking online, are selling for between $6 and $10 per chip for a 10, 12 ml refill. Guys, how every time you refill, yeah, <laughs> you're six to $10 just for the chip. Pro 100, what is it, $50 for the resetter, $40, $50 for the resetter? You can use that 100, 1,000 times. Yeah. All right. Mike, slide the camera back to you, buddy, so that okay. before you uh, say goodbye. Yeah. So are you telling me that what what does an OEM cartridge for that printer sell for? I want to get a date. $15 or so. $15. So you're paying $10 plus third-party ink to save what? What are you saving? What, $3? It could be three, eight dollars, but basically, people already 
refillers are used to being able to reset the chip and continuing to use the printer. Okay. You don't expect that to be five, six, even eight dollars per refill. I mean, I, I told Joe this. Look, on a Pro One Thousand, people say the chips are expensive, but I explained to Joe on a Pro One Thousand, the tanks are eighty ml, and they're paying twelve dollars per chip for eighty ml. And you'll buy a consumer level printer for what, three fifty? And even if you got the chip for six dollars each, for even ten fifteen ml refill, which is more expensive to run? All right, which is more expensive to run? Adds up very quickly. So, you know, the the, the Pro One Thousand, yeah, it's twelve dollars per chip. I admit that. And but the alternatives are not nice. And there's some new chips out of China that I saw through a acquaintance here that are selling for twenty dollars per chip. So they're supposed to work. They're supposed to actually reset. I have not he heard a single word whether these work or not. So we'll just have to wait. So th the long and short of it is that um, if you're a refiller, you're used to refilling. Take care of your printers because the next era is not going to be very nice to refillers. I think that's you know? I think that's already here. Here, if you if if you like a nice high quality basic machine, you've got the Pro One Hundred. It's now gone from 150 to 350 after rebates. And yeah. You still got some Pro 10s left in the market for about $500 as opposed to what, $899 for the replacement, the Pro 300. And we don't know whether or not the chips on the Pro 300 will be resettable. Okay. Wouldn't it be um, nice if they actually use the same exact? cartridge uh the they, fact that they use a different number yeah that's on that the tanks that. usually tells you not yeah right now i get quite a number of calls through time when customers ask me what printer should i get it used to be that if they were printing photos and wanted a decent photo printer when the Pro 100 was selling for 150 or so after rebate, that was the go-to machine. Yeah, um, there was really nothing comparable in terms of performance, um, cost of running, ruggedness, reliability. Nothing compared to that machine at that price. Mm. Uh, and with the Artisan 15,000, Epson Expression 15,000. It pales in comparison to running costs. It's, it's more than night and day. It's 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 like it's different between Mars and the Earth. That's the difference between the cost of running those two machines. Wow. Right? Uh, so there's nothing left there except Pro 100 still kicking around for 350 I don't know how long that era will last. Um, yeah, I just used did, to be uh, Last week I showed on uh, eBay. I just did a quick search. Uh, people are selling in box Pro 100s for six, five. Well, there's a place called B and H down in um, in New York. Apparently, still got them for three fifty after rebate. So, I don't know how long that stock will last. Yeah. Uh, on the on even on the desktop machines. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you wanted an Epson, I used to recommend the Workforce series, just like I have right here. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason I like this machine for an Epson workforce is because it has cartridges. Let me see that. That right on the print head. Yes. I don't like the Epson machines that have stationary cartridges on the workforce series because I've often seen they get problems. And once they get problems, it's game over for the consumer. They're too hard to service because of the stationary cartridge. Yeah. These we can get to the printhead, we can do cleaning cartridges, we can do lots of stuff. But despite that, my workforce 
has it's been four years, five years now I've had this one, mm. and I use it every day. Reliable. Apparently, these are going for like five, six hundred dollars on eBay now. Wow. Because you can get aftermarket tanks that have ARCs on them. But the big thing, when people ask me, well, I used to have a cannon. Should I get a workforce? I'm going to go beyond your time if, I, if you don't mind, Joe. Because go ahead. I think it's very useful. When you get this workforce series, there is one thing you've got to learn to live with. I talked about air. No matter what you do, how often you print, eventually you get bad nozzle checks. And you will have to do like three, four, five, six, seven, eight head cleanings at times to clear those nozzle checks and get them back good. Nothing you can do about it. It's not the end of the printer. You don't panic. You don't think it's the end of the world. You just got to go through your nozzle checks because Epson printers don't go from working one day to completely clogged the other day. It's not clogging. It's air that's reached its way down to the nozzles. All you got to do is flush out ink, get it back working again. But some people are just not into it. They freak out. And with the lack, remember Epson, Epson printers without a working chip simply will not run. You cannot override chips on an Epson printer. Even though you won't destroy its printhead, it will not run without a, a functioning chip. Mm. All right? Now, I've been testing this machine here. I think that's a Canon 8220. I was not a fan of that machine, the, the 5020, and the, I had in this spot on top there some MG series machines that used the 250, 251. I was not a great fan of those machines, despite them being okay. Uh, they were last of the inexpensive all-in-ones. But this machine, I'm quite impressed with. The only issue with this machine is that it does not have auto reset chips and doesn't have any chips for it. But you can override. And I'm getting pretty good photo quality prints out of this desktop letter size printer. The Original OEM setup tanks can be refilled, provided you do not print heavily. So the best way to refill them is you just take the ink tank out, you invert them, put it on a scale, squeeze, uh, best thing to use your squeeze system, squeeze inks back on the sponge, 20 grams, cut it out, put it back in, you're done. You just got to do that more frequently, and you can't depend on the chips to tell you when you're low on ink. That's the price you pay. But otherwise, the 280-281 machines, the printhead design is slightly different from the previous Canon ones, and they seem to be, in my testing, much more reliable than the older printers. So at this point in time, if you don't have a lot of money to spend, you want some decent photos at times, you want a text machine. Oh, text on this machine I did not find to be great. Even with the OEM tanks, uh, on high speed of printing a text, on dark areas, I would get banding. Not banding and missing nozzles, but ink flow issues. I don't know if what Canon did, but um, you got to slow down the printing of text on dark areas, but normal text, it's okay. It's when you have illustrative graphics. I get uneven ink flow, and I can see it on the paper where each printhead pass alternating has a slight tonal difference in color. Some people, they don't mind, so it's okay. But I get a lot of calls asking, what printer should I buy? And it's getting awfully, awfully tough now to to recommend a printer. Uh, at, one, at some point, uh, I'll start to recommend going to the Canon G Series tank printers or the Epson Eco tanks, and that's all left. You gotta pay lots of money up front just to be able to print something. And yeah, those put, are pretty expensive 
you know. Yeah, they're expensive. The printer goes. And they're not the highest quality print. Just understand that. They're not yeah. truly, in my mind, photo quality because this Canon printer here, and I picked this up for about 100 and something or 80 and $90, so I can't remember. It's the six tank with the photo blue. Uh, my photo blue is gorgeous on it. It works just like the OEM. But this will outprint any of the Epson Eco tank, night and day, night and day. It's true photo quality, especially for 100 bucks. So that's, you know, when, when the Pro 100 days are gone, and even today, if you don't have 350 to spend and you want a basic letter size with the occasional photo, this will do the trick for you. Yep. 8220, 9220, even the five tank machines. I mean, before Joe, we would always go to the $150 Pro 100. It's a no brainer. Right. You know, at 350, some people don't have that money. I understand. So we got to come up with something for them. And this is what my, um, this is what my solution is. And I have profiles for these. So even if you want to get down to using profiles, with papers and get literally perfect prints on your inexpensive desk. So, and these go, by the way, up to 13 inches, I think, as well. So when the Pro 100 gets to $500, um, maybe you spend $200 and get one of these 280, 281s, but they're not built as well. I mean, I, I can show you how it's built. Just let me bring this thing here. So your viewers can get an idea what they they're facing. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a nice machine. It has a CD. It can print CDs as well. And that's something for rarity these days. Okay. If you look inside, oh, let me see there. You can see there's there's no metal bar. I don't want to stick my hand in there while it's moving. Okay, so these I'm using aftermarket ink in them. Okay, um, if you look in there, I guess you can't see very well. There is no stainless steel rod, it's just a bent metal bar, plate steel. It's very, very thin here so it doesn't take up too much space it's, it's a bare bones square chassis it has a, this one can do rear feed which at one point Canon had done away with but they brought it back kudos it has a paper cassette tray this can come out automatically when you turn the printer on if you want, but it also can print CDs. Some people have been asking about this. Here it is, it's back. Optical media. Some old people like us, we just want to print CDs, huh? Yeah, I do that a lot. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it can do that. No resetter, but hey, you got to have something and you only got so much money. Raise your camera up. Oops. Yep. All I'm gonna do is show you my stomach, which is getting too big. Well, that's so. Old. I've covered quite a bit today. I think I hope okay. I haven't bored you people. When is the I'm final? I scared track? you from Joe's channel, and I thank Joe for letting me be on. When when is the final exam gonna be uh, issued? For exam? Yeah, uh, this is like going back to college. Oh, that. Oh, you're on your own. When are you going to test us? Make no, sure you'll you... test yourself. If, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you get into trouble, you're the one, then you got to figure it out. All righty. Well, Mike, thank you once again. I know this was two weeks earlier than you should have uh, been on, but I appreciate it. I really didn't have much to talk about today, so I'm really... Well, I talked about a lot, a lot, yeah. a lot. Probably too much for people to take in. You know, if anybody has more questions 
about what I talked about, Senator Joe, and maybe in a couple of weeks when I'm back, I can go in more detail to answer those questions. Mike, uh, I'm going to go through these questions later, but let me show you this one that was just posted here. I don't know if we take a, a good look at it. You know how the Pro 10 gray really is the dark gray from the Pro 1, right? Okay. Is the is the gray from the Pro 1000 the same density as the Not exactly. The the Pro 1000 ink set people is not identical to the Pro 10. Yeah, I figure it would It is identical to the Pro 1. Okay? That would be the metal, the middle gray then on the Pro 1. You have three grays on the no, Pro. The, the Pro 1 had dark gray. Gray and light gray. gray. And light gray. The, the dark gray on the Pro 1 was the same as gray on the Pro 10. Or the 300. Right? Yeah. All right. No, the 300 is a different ink set. Uh oh. Let's it's get that straight. It's uh -oh. not the identical ink set. Oh boy. We will find out in time whether I think it's gonna be the identical ink set as a pro one thousand. Oh, okay. Okay, I think it's gonna yeah. be that, but okay. don't hold me to that until my testing. Okay, but be, that's typically what Canon has done. No yeah, because they call it the IPF, yeah. Right. So on the Pro 1000, it's not identical. But if you insist on using that, I think it's the gray, not the photo gray. So yeah. it's, it's so, gray and, and photo gray, right? Yeah. Yeah, the closest one would be gray. You can try that and see if that works. Um, I, I tried running Pro 1 gray to replace the Pro 10 gray. I no. really didn't, yeah. You know, I really didn't see a huge problem until I became aware of it. I know you told me. And I sw quickly switched back to the dark gray from the Pro 1 onto the Pro 10. Because remember, I had hundreds of PGI 29 cartridges to suck ink out of. So right. I, I collected quite a bit of ink. And so I had the luxury to, you know, fill my Pro 10 with uh, OEM inks. So, yeah what you know what other choice could they have now you said that the third party pro 10 gray ink is actually pretty good it's very very good uh, yeah, my that, testing is is, yeah. is it's that the advantage it's a one to me it's a one to one yeah so would you suggest to people who are basically losing sleep over what ink they should replace that gray ink with Try it. Yeah. I mean, you can buy a two ounce. Try it. See mm -hmm. if it does the job. If it doesn't do the job, how much you're you're out for? But you can try either one. You can go try the, the seventeen hundred and gray and see if that works. Mm -hmm. Let me see what else what we. These are some of the last entries here that were software. No, we so, did not say that. No, okay. that's such a chipless solutions, right? Right. I, I guess he's referring to what? What are you? I don't know what he's referring to. The I, chipless solution, as far as I know, still works on the old P800s. Right. I think Epson has given up on modifying anything more in the P800s. How about this guy right here? Again, I don't know anything beyond 17 inch, so... Again, 36 this, inches or wider. Well, that's, that's great questions. That it depends on if you want to refill or not refill, and and what your what your desires are. Because remember, Canon wide format printers cannot print with any kind of of liquid like Epson can. Yeah. All right. So. After days of scanning, what? He's probably scanning the internet. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, okay. Uh, oh, here's a good one. 
how would you figure out, I mean, as durable as the 2200 ink set was, I mean, uh, printhead was, how do you determine when it is actually, okay, it's damaged? This is nothing I can fix by cleaning or, or, or anything. I don't know what he's referring to. Whether I don't know whether he means I no well, matter. Well, I, I guess I, I think what he's, he's he's referring to Joe is that he's probably got some some printing issues, like not getting good nozzle check, right? And he doesn't know whether or not the printhead is gone, the printer is gone, the 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 parking station, whether or not that could be gone too. The yeah, ink he's be, using. It could be something totally unrelated to the printhead. Yeah. If he's just bought the printer and it's not working with no known history of what happened before, yeah, it's very, very tough. But very, very tough. Because you could go down, try all sorts of stuff, spend tons of money, and come up with not. So generally, I always tell people, if you're going to buy a used printer, Always make sure that it's working properly before you take it home. After it's been working and things develop, then we yeah. you can have a better idea of what might be going on. But if you buy one that's not working. The same guy, Mike Poe, Luke Poe. That's what I was yeah discussing earlier. All yeah, right, no, uh, let me let you go. I don't want to keep you here all night. Let's see if there's anything else that would be something you could answer. Somebody wants somebody wants inks set, sent overseas from your company, and we know what the issue with that is. So I'm not going to. Well, actually, to actually, I have been sending the occasional one. Okay. But it, it has to be, especially in COVID. Yeah. Um, normal mail in COVID is hell internationally because you don't know what's going on in any given country. And even in the U.S., they've had some bad issues in certain regions where mail wasn't being delivered on time because of COVID, even yeah. in Canada as well. Um, the most secure way getting it across is through a courier. Yeah. It's costly. Have, some people yeah, still want a, it. Don't some people a, don't want it. All right? Yeah. So if I send something, it's going to be by courier. That could run 50 to to $100 for an order. Yeah, not worth it. For some people, it's not worth it. Depends. Yeah. Here's a $64,000, no, million dollar question. <laughs> How long? Okay, let let me let me explain to you what's going on at the Pro 300. Okay, can we refill those tanks on the Pro 300? Unquestionably, yes, absolutely, we can do that. So, question is, will we be able to reset those chips? Well, yes and no. Sideways. Let me let me explain what's going on there. Okay, I have spoken with Red Setter about the situation. They are willing. Wait, wait. To look at the situation. Wait a minute. You spoke to who? Red Setter. And who is Red Setter? They the don't. people that make Pro Ten resetters in Germany. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. They are the only ones making Pro Ten resetters in the world. Mm -hmm. So, but here's the reality of the situation for resetters. If he were to have paid an engineer to go hack into a Pro 10 machine and sell only Pro 10 machines from the start, he would not make money even after all these years. It's because the Pro 10 and Pro 100 were so similar that he was able to leverage off the work on the Pro 100, which is a much higher volume product than the Pro 10. So because of the high volume product in the Pro 100, he invested time to investigate where it can be done. And if it could be done, he would be paid back on his, on his investment. 
The Pro 300, we have to wait until we see what the Pro 100 replacement comes out to be. If the Pro 100 replacement, we hope, and Canon isn't listening, to be similar to the Pro 300 chip-wise, then there is hope that the 300, there may be a resetter. If the Pro 100 does not turn out to be resettable, I doubt there will be any further work done on the Pro 300. So yeah, they, would have, yeah, they would have to have that particular printer they hope to crack on hand, right? They would have to yeah. have a sample of the printer. Yeah. Means purchasing one from North America, shipping it to Germany, mm -hmm. and they start working on it. If they're able to crack a Pro 100 replacement, then everybody goes, okay, let's try the 300 now. Yeah. But if there's no Pro 100 replacement and we're lucky enough that the Pro 100 becomes a Pro 100 Mark II using the same CLI 42 chips. Oh, well. Well, then I don't think anybody's going to be digging into Pro 300 because the sales volume simply won't be there. Nobody's going to want to pay $400 for a resetter for the Pro 300. But, yeah. but um, engineering talent is costly. If if about 90% of all printer owners tend to not even know what refilling is or are scared to death of refilling and they tend to use OEM, do you think that 10% loss is enough for them to really crack down hard? And like you said, with the example of a future Pro 100 Mark II, would they change the chip? On I don't think it's it's the loss of, of that sale so much driving the manufacturers, Joe. I think it is mainly they're trying to stop the aftermarket from recapturing OEM tanks and refurbishing them and reselling them. And that's why the chip issues have always been destroy the chip, destroy the chip. Because you'll find out pretty soon making plastic devices is not that expensive but creating new chips is a lot more money. Mm -hmm. All right, because the people who create the chips need to be compensated. Right. <clears throat> All right, and, and, and like I said, the aftermarket one-time chips are, are what it is. And, and, and there you go, the, the P800, remember? Mm -hmm. Every chip has got to be unique. Every chip has to be unique. In the world. Yeah. And like you explained to me a while, a long time ago, the P800 records in its internal memory every single chip it from has every seen. cartridge that you load. So it knows. And it also records the ink level. So uh -huh. if even if even if you have the same cartridge, and somehow it comes back with a higher ink level. It's going to say, no, you've tampered with me. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, if by some miracle somebody is able to reset a P800 chip to a higher level, but the printer's seen it already, it says no go. And how do I know this? Because I tested this with the ARC chip. If you put an original ARC chip in, you use it. Not original. If you put an aftermarket ARC chip in, you use it. Mm -hmm. and you come along with the identical new one, it won't take it because it's seeing the same chip ID with so, a higher ink level. But if you reuse the one that had been used before, it will take it. So you're saying that every single example of refillable P800 cartridges, yellow, magenta, light magenta, all the way down to the gray, are using the same identical ID code, color codes? No. All the, but so, the, the color code might be identical. That that byte might be identical. Right. But the digital signature, the, like the serial number of that cartridge, is each one is different. No, I mean the, the aftermarket batch of P800 
printers, uh, uh, print the aftermarket batch of cartridges that were created and sold worldwide. Every yellow cartridge had the same code. Every yellow cartridge chip, because I can take my aftermarket refillable. Yellow yeah, on the aftermarket side, they all have the same yeah. code. Correct. Right, and I use it and I bring it that to empty, and then I say, "Hey, Mike, can you give me your yellow?" It will not accept it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what that's that's what no one knew about because the printer wants to see that a different chip is being used and not the it's same. Not just different. It, it's it's got it figured out. It's got the memory on it. Right. It's got to see a different yellow chip with a different ID code so that it knows it's another individual, a unique individual, not the same one that you cheated and reset to full. Right. Right. To fool me. Right. The other no. printers apparently don't care because. Yeah. No, people may think this is a very expensive process. How can they do this? Well, how much does a P800 tank cost? What? 50 bucks US? 60. 60? 59. Okay. Yeah. We hear of these things called the Internet of Things, where we've got routers mm -hmm. that are, what, 20 bucks each? Yeah. Right? Like a, a simple router, two port, three port, four port router, mm -hmm. like for 20, 30 bucks each. But remember, each one of those routers has a unique MAC address on it. Yeah. Right? Of I, There's no item in the world that's made with the same MAC address. So as we get into the Internet of Things, where everything is communicating on Wi-Fi or wireless, etc., and these things are getting cheap. I mean, you can get plugs that are controlled by your Wi-Fi etc all have a certain address mm -hmm. cameras right yep alexa yeah. alexa whatever what well, alexa is expensive but still yeah. yeah still the cost to actually put a digital signature unique one on each and every item is not very expensive anymore so what we used to think what oh they can't do that that would cost a ton of money we have to change our thinking that it can be done for very little money now. How are these digital unique codes generated so that they have the correct logical sequence of... Don't ask me. I'm not the fab yeah. guy. Yeah, so that's... Um, that's beyond my pay grade. Yeah, yeah. So, in other words, so the, the people who created this batch of chips for these P800 refillable cartridges that you used to sell as well mm -hmm. back in the day. You didn't know. Nobody knew. No one knew. Um, only the European people and other countries that were not locked out, they were able to use these. But we were not. So, you know, how did they acquire that first set of codes? To create that first batch of, I don't know. They may have gotten their hands on a Pro One Hundred. Yeah, I often wonder about how they look they, at the, they, the the chip decoder board. They have thirty sets of nine each codes pre-programmed in them. Did they go out and buy nine sets of cartridges? And so yeah, they may have. Or they may have they may have retrieved nine sets of used ones, right? Who okay. knows, right? Who knows? Yeah. So then, if I take a used chip and I'm able to reset it, but I give it to you, theoretically, I should be able to use it. Printer sees it as a new entity. It has never seen that. Theoretically, unique. yeah. It has never seen that unique ID code, right? Right. I'm sure there's some other way that they'll they'll nab you. Well, I'm sure there's some. At other this way. point in time, nobody can reset them, right, Joe? Right. We, so can. we haven't tested whether that could work, but in theory, yeah. it should work. 
But in this very interconnected world, mm -hmm. I would not be surprised if Epson Phone Home comes along. Yeah. For the young people there, there used to be a movie called E.T. Phone, E.T. Yeah. Extraterrestrial. Yeah. And there was a thing called E.T. Phone oh, Home. That right? lot of years, man. <laughs> yeah, that's been that's that tells you how old we are. Yeah. But there used to be a movie and the story is called E.T. Extraterrestrial. That was in the 80s. Yeah. 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 Talking about yeah. the 80s. Remember I showed you this at the start. Look at that. Look at that. Windows call. 95, the official oh, mouse pad from Microsoft, introducing wow. Microsoft Office. <laughs> Yep. Windows 95. How old is this? This has got to be 25 years old, at least. Yeah. Mid 90s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's when Microsoft was introducing Microsoft Office for Windows 95. Wow. <laughs> so awesome. Anyways, I got to go. All right. It's been fun. Got any little teases for the next uh, two weeks from now? No, you got to come up with them, Joe. I'll come up with something good. Don't worry. All righty. Thank we'll you. We'll see so what we can do to oblige you, okay? Yep. All right. We'll see you the next time. Yeah. All right, folks. Always an experience. I tell you, my brain is hurting right now. And I'm sure you guys' brains are also hurting as well. But again, what can I tell you? The man is an expert in the field. He goes way deeper than I would ever even think of ever going on any of these subjects. Before I, I'm going to probably, don't be mad at me, but I'm going to probably ignore some of these comments here because really we only have less than like 25 minutes left here. And I wanted to show you guys something, but I, I'll make, I'll do my best to try to address everybody. So let me go over to the shared screen here. Mike told me to go to this site. Now, this is in Canada. This is a, a um, basically a camera and all about photography company, sells, you know. And so here they have the P900, as you can see. And I want you to take a look at this here. I'm going to go ahead and use my mouse and select this. Now, it says, how to determine your ink cartridge shelf life? Well, it says two years from the printed production date. So that's, that's like any other cartridge. It has a printed date. So you assume that before you crack it open, okay, you have two years to be able to use it, okay? Here I am. Just like right here, there's a date printed right here. So before I crack this open... I got two years, and then once I insert it into my printer, they say six months. But take a look at what it says at the very end. So it says two years from printer production date or six months after open printer is designed to, whoa, wait a minute. It's designed to use with Epson cartridges only. Does that mean that Epson P900 is designed to be used with only Epson cartridges, because it says not third-party cartridges or ink. I have never seen that mentioned in any, any other, any other, um, you know, post or review or any anything of the sort, although most reviewers don't even touch the subject of refilling. Now, we don't have time to go over all of this. I'm going to save this to maybe next week. So I'm going to go ahead and save this um, very, very nice, very complete, by the way, report. Look at that. I mean, it just goes on forever. So it even has comments already from people who read it. So we're going to go ahead and save that till the next time because, again, we'll be here all night. I didn't know that Mike wanted to stay that long. He said he only had about an hour tonight. So he stayed with us over two and a half hours almost. So let me quickly go through everything here because I don't want to ignore folks. I've done it in the past and I feel very bad about that. So I think we already said hello to the vast majority of folks here. 
Let me see where it was that. So, yeah, somebody wanted to know, yeah, about that. Sebastian Clune asked about firmware for the Pro 100 or the P100. I think you mean the Pro 100. Um, yeah, not that I know of, my friend. Right now, there's nothing. And again, we're all waiting, you know, with our fingers crossed and bated breath for the new release, if it's ever going to be released this year or not. Things are not going as quickly as normal, of course, in the situation the world is in. Chris Bell, PC technician. And by the way, I told you, I am back on my computer, my friend. And last week, I had a problem that I did not realize what was going on. Okay. So, as you know, I got tons of things that I need to co connect via USB. So, somehow, this microphone here was not being detected. And I did not realize it. I thought I was actually speaking through this mic. In reality, I was speaking to the super crappy mic on my webcam. And that was a problem with last week's audio. So I got a brand new uh, multi-port um, powered hub. And I got everything hooked up and everything is working perfectly fine. Let's see what else we got here. Oh, boy. Yeah, some of these were silly, so I'm not going to post them. You guys can see them. So John Longitano from Long Island, New York, is here as well. Glad you are here with us, and I hope you have enjoyed the very long hair talk with Mike. Again, the man is just a walking encyclopedia when it comes to um, this subject. Somebody complained about some lag, and I don't think I don't think we're having lag because otherwise I would have seen it from his broadcast from his end on my end here. What was he saying about refilling the three hundred? Well, yeah, you you can refill it. Of course you can. Yeah, ab absolutely, no problem. But you cannot reset the chip until a, res a resetter is created by the company Red Setter. I think Mike even offered to buy them a Pro 300 because that's the only way that they can go ahead and do that. They're not going to spend the money and buy a, a printer that they may not be able to succeed at being able to crack that chip to be able to reset it. The, the Canon printers, just like we were discussing about unique ID codes, in other words, color codes, so, for instance, this matte black cartridge has a unique color code for matte black. Another matte black cartridge has a different code. The, excuse me, the level code, if you will, is a separate part of the chip um, recorded information, if you will. The ID code is read-only, cannot be rewritten over. In other words, I cannot create a new ID code for this chip. I just cannot. I can reset it, however, to full. But the 3880 doesn't care that it's seeing the same exact chip all of a sudden magically back up to full. It doesn't care. Janet Diaz is here or was here with us. Long time no seen. I think she's a Puerto Rican girl, beautiful girl. Thank you for being here, my friend. Again, I miss you. ND Coach 29 says hello. Again, another lovely, lovely lady that comes to visit our live streams. King Kong says, Jose, if you're running out of contact, contact, could you do a comparison with the X-Rite Studio versus the Pro 2 or 3 when it comes to printer calibration? I know I how much experience does the Pro make in how much difference, I'm sorry, does the Pro make in accuracy? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good, uh, subject. Um, I do have, let me, let me continue on here a minute. I do have both the color monkey, which is just like the I one studio, but see, there might be a difference between the I one studio physically and the older color monkey. You could, however, use the same software for the I one studio. So I could make a comparison. It basically does the same thing. 
it prints 50 patches and then you scan those and then it creates a secondary set of 50 patches and you scan those and finally it just compiles all the information does a lot of ex extrapolation in in um, you know using algorithms to create what was in between whereas the i1 pro i can i can do a 1600 patch set of charts i got a new set of charts back there for a customer that i got to get done here's the i1 pro 2 and um, the reason I haven't done that, if you're lurking here tonight, is that, again, I was having problems connecting my i1 Pro 2 to my computer. And it wasn't until yesterday evening that the mail came late with my new hub, and I was able to get it to its own unique USB port. It needs USB 3.0 for that one. So I got it going. It is uh, repeatedly loading correctly. It was cutting out halfway through the scan, so I couldn't even begin to scan your uh, uh, charts. But I will handle that tomorrow evening. I got to spend all day tomorrow with Nathan. Uh, Chris Bell had to leave. I guess he's got to go to work tomorrow. He's got something more important than being here. Believe me, that's a lot more important. Terry says, hi, Mike, too. Okay, a lot of people are saying hi to each other. Rick in Canada, all righty. And uh, Azubik Mojik, I don't know how to pronounce that. Mojiki says, hey, all right. We're getting people from all over the world, man. That is awesome. Elgin is saying, haha, I don't know why. So you have to put your whole printer into vacuum to fix this. What? Yeah, I guess so. I think I think you're talking about doing a um, head cleaning. Yeah, Mike um, got a good explanation from Luke. That's basically it. Once once that gasket gets dirty. Uh, it doesn't seal. So, light black on Epson SC P800 always clogs, drives me crazy. Try cleaning sponge with Windex and and print it. Flushing inks channel still a problem. Um, OEM ink. I know that it's late, and I just now got got to these. But whenever you have a specific channel clogging, um, that's a little bit odd. That doesn't really happen often. Um, but again, I don't know. I, I assume because it's a P800, I hope you are in the US. If you are, then you probably are not refilling. So um, I really don't know why that would occur. It could be any channel at all. And again, why? Really no, no way to answer that. It's one of those mysteries. Yeah, Inkjet Mall has lots of really, really good videos. They have a young lady there that runs their technical side of things. Yeah, she's not only pretty, but she is really, really, really smart and really good at that. She just doesn't look like she would be, okay? It's a little bit distracting when you're, when you're looking at her doing what she does. Um, again, we could not answer uh, what could possibly be a 2200 print hit. Uh, determination as to whether it is actual damage or just something else peripheral, some other peripheral problem causing whatever you're experiencing. Okay. Whatever you think is making you think about the print have been damaged. In other words, it could be quite a few things. Airflow. I don't know. Let's see what else. How about to set up? Okay, yeah. So there you go. You are going to enjoy that. Again, do it correctly. So you do not reduce your ink flow efficiency. In fact, my playlist, okay, about the CLI 42 modifications, watch that. Everything is there. Tango says goodbye. Nice to see you again. Rick Johnson is here. Yeah, they are, they are selling out. 
whatever is left, I think Canon may have had an agreement with B&H. Maybe B&H signed some sort of agreement saying, we're going to sell this number of Pro 100s. Yeah. And they're not being manufactured any, any longer. So whatever is left in the warehouses, wherever Canon stores stuff here in the U.S., they are providing them with a number of Pro 100s. I don't think there's going to be a huge number. I've never used as a pro photographer third-party inks on my ProGraph 2000. By all means, yes. If you can afford it, then by all means, only use OEM. It is the best. And again, like Mike explained, I think this is a slightly different density. I think it's more like the... Um, like the regular gray in the Pro 1, which is a lighter version of what the Pro 10 considers as gray. And he suggested you just buy an equivalent bottle of the ink for the Pro 10. PC inks for the Pro 10 are really, really good. No idea, my friend, no idea, because again, I just don't have access to those printers. Either one, Epson and Canon, believe me, they are all excellent. No, the, the software for the P800 still works. It just will not work for the P900, okay? So, yeah, that, that'll still work. We got 42 people still here. We had 59 just before Mike left. And so, of course, now Joe is here. I cannot, I cannot compete with a rock star, so... Still no shipping to Canada. Shipping from who? If you mean PC, he lives in Canada. So I don't know what restrictions they have over there, but he lives in Ontario, so... Oh, you mean... Okay, you mean printers, yeah. I think Rick got that a lot better than I did. Okay. Sounds like a plan. How long after launch will we know refill options of the Pro 300? Like I said, you can do that the minute you get it. Well, I wouldn't recommend that, but, you know. And what you do is you dis disable ink monitoring if they still allow you to do that. I think they do. And then you just have to continually top off your cartridges. That's all. Two Pro 10s, one with OEM, one with PC, and a new 24 inch uh, HP Z9 something. Uh, those are nice. Those are really nice. Yeah. Really, really nice printers. Do you have ink for the IPF 2000? Yes, they do. That would be PC, I, I assume. I think I told you that. Except, you know, remember, they do not ship overseas. I've noticed a weird banding issue in an evaluation picture. New Pro 10. Mm. With OEM ink and QImage Ultimate. It's in your Facebook group. Can you guess what that might be the issue? I'll take a look. I saw one that was uh, more of a banding on the sky. And I think that was a uh, problem with the uh, nozzle check maybe not being 100%. Glad you enjoyed it. I'm so glad. We'll keep on having him come on. At first, it was just going to be a monthly thing. And now I think we might be able to get them twice a month. Lynn Quinn, hi from the UK. I have an Epson P800 great printer. I have a Pro 1 eats cards. Okay, you mean it eats ink. Yeah, it does. I also have an Epson L805, basically an Artisan 50. With Epson continuous ink system, dye inks like the old Epson 1270. I used to have a 1280. Thank you for all the great information. Appreciate that. 
God, you guys enjoy this. Robert Danichilo. Danichilo? Danichilo? Danichilo or Chilo? Hi, Jose. If I struggle to print regularly, I and I have three to four large prints to make on a Pro 1000. Does it make a difference if I print them all in one day or print them one per day for four days? No, not at all. And when it needs to run a cleaning cycle, it's going to it's going to run it. There's no way to even predict anymore. We used to think we could predict that, but there's really no way to predict when it happens. Uh, no, no problem. You can print them in the same day or every other day or once a day, whatever. It doesn't really matter much this day and age with that printer. Cal Johnson bought a PC3800 ink. I bought PC3800 ink and I refilled my 3800 carts 50%. Oh, yeah, I suppose so. Um, that particular ink set is not as well matched as other or the P800, for instance, ink set is. You may end up at some point during the transition period, you may end up seeing some changes, especially gloss differential because third-party magenta ink is just notorious for not being as glossy. And so anything that uses magenta, you're going you're gonna to notice a bit of gloss differential here and there. Color-wise, it'll be fine. I think it'll be okay. And I think that's it for all of the comments. Let me go ahead and we'll save that North Light Images report, Keith Cooper's report on the Pro 300 for the next time. Uh, what I'm going to be doing this week is gonna, I got three days with Nathan all day long. So if I get home and I'm too tired, I just basically vegetate upstairs. So we're going to go ahead and try to do some Q&A videos for everybody. I uh, will try to address as many questions as I can. And that'll be just something like I used to do before. I used to call it Friday night chit chat where I would answer five comments from people. What paper matches old Siva Chrome? Ah, nothing really matches old Siva Chrome, but where did I put that? Where did I put it? Did I take it back to the other room? I think I may have. Canon um, Platinum. Platinum Gloss. Yep. On a dye ink printer. So Canon Platinum Gloss on the P800. The P400. Ugh. The Pro 100. Too many printers in my head. Yep. It's just deadly glossy i mean it's just it looks wet almost and so that would be about as close as you can get. there's really no way to seba chrome i believe was a direct reversal type paper i did two seba chromes my whole life two of them uh back when i worked at the pentagon lab and so yeah amazing amazing weird almost weird look um and the only thing that I know of that will even come close to that level of gloss is Canon um, Platinum Gloss. Robert is leaving us. Hope you had a great week and uh, look forward to the new Monday. Tomorrow is a work day for you, I hope. Um, for me, it's a work day, meaning that I got to get up and go hang out with my uh grandson and do some tutoring for the summer. We've been running through this math book and uh, he's got to do a couple of pages every day. And uh, now he's got a book report he's got to finish. So I've been really uh, getting uh, coming down hard on him about that. And uh, yeah, the parents are very grateful for this grandpa. Yeah. All righty. Thanks, Joe. Get some new glasses yet? No, not yet. I sure will. Um, the first one on the list will be my wife. So she needs a, a new set of prescription glasses. But I'm going to get some so I can see what the hell am I reading here. And Charles Bruggen is also here. Roger Jones saying thank you. All righty. So that is about it, folks. We're getting close to that time. We're going to go ahead and 
play us a little bit of uh, music here. We'll switch over to the uh, goodbye screen here. Let me turn that up a bit more. Hope you guys enjoyed tonight. Again, it was a bit disorganized, I have to admit. But again, that's usually the best. Uh, Mike usually um, comes up with, uh, as, as we talk on the phone, that's what, that's what we do. We'll stay on two hours on the phone discussing stuff. And always something comes up and I say, hey, that would be a good subject for you to talk about on the live stream. Again, I will... He will forget, he will forget more than I will ever learn. That type of guy. Tango, thank you for hanging out this long with us, Tango. And again, keep safe out there, my friend. Thank you too. More drink. By the way, I forgot to feature today's drink. You can't see it very well, but it's called ice. And this one is strawberry, no kiwi, strawberry. Really good. Keeps me hydrated. <laughs> All right, so until next week, hasta la vista, baby. Happy printing, everybody. Bye-bye.